Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today we're going to be addressing relearn.org, Dale Partridge, who puts out videos on a lot of different topics and um, has some shorts out on Instagram, one of which was tagged uh, by one of my listeners and he asked, hey, could you go through this? Could you talk through this? Uh, relearn.org is a fairly popular site, I think, among some people, especially uh, those on Instagram and places where you like to see short clips of things and uh, he has a particular video on there, on there called is calvinism biblical and i thought we would take the opportunity to go and listen to it i think they have it kind of at a higher speed because it's going pretty quick um, but i'm just going to take each section one by one as we've done in the past um, and just kind of walk through why we as non-calvinist as provisionist uh, disagree with what dale is presenting uh, we're not we're not besmirching him. <laughs> we're not calling him names. I'm not calling him a heretic and throwing him out of the kingdom. I disagree with his conclusions because I think he's using faulty uh, hermeneutics. I think he's using fallacies to come to his conclusions. Uh, I don't think he's using uh, you know uh, good biblical hermeneutics and exegesis. Now, obviously, he might say the same thing about my conclusions, but that's why we have these discussions. We can show respect to people while still saying. I just think you're wrong. I think you've come to the wrong conclusion about these things. Um, I am watching the side chat. This is a, um, uh, a live chat and a live discussion, so I liked to hear the discussion questions. And uh, so I see a, a few on the side chat already saying hi, hi to you. Uh, and the, the kind words from Dom22, thank you for those kinds of words, and I appreciate the prayers, uh, as always. And I will try to engage with some of those questions if they're pertaining to what we're actually talking about. Uh, but let me remind you what is scrolling there on the bottom of the screen. Uh, for those of you who can support this ministry, I really do appreciate those who give on a regular basis because it helps us to promote this ministry. The only way we're going to get it out there is if it's being promoted, if you're sharing it on your own Instagram or your Facebook, wherever social media, whatever social media you're on, if you're sharing what we're doing, it helps a ton. And we can't do this without our patrons. You can make a one-time donation there at the support link that's in the show notes. We really do appreciate that. And, and I, I can't thank our patrons enough for all the support you give to make this broadcast happen. Thank you for that. And also remember uh, that if you're looking for a higher theological education, Trinity Seminary is a great place for you to consider. You can click on that class link there at sociology101.com if you want to find more in information about trinitysim.edu. And so... Without any further ado, let's listen to Dale Partridge explaining why he believes Calvinism is biblical. Here's what we're going to do. It's only a 90-second clip. So I'm going to play the 90-second clip in its entirety, and on Instagram it just replays. And then the second time it plays, we will stop and go through it like we have in the past with other videos to be able to give some critique and some just help people to see uh, how we as provisionists, non-Calvinists, would respond to a typical online Calvinist that we run into a, a lot. So uh, let's listen in. Here we go. L let me know sound-wise. I've never played off of Instagram before, so I have no idea. Levels, uh, I, I can't control that here on uh, StreamYard, unfortunately. So let me know if it's uh, way too loud or too quiet. Here we go. John MacArthur recently said, I became a Calvinist because the Bible gave me no other option. Charles Spurgeon said, Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. So why do so many people reject Calvinism? Because it requires us to realize that we have no involvement in the cause of our salvation. It's the biblical truth that we don't choose Christ, but Christ chooses us. Calvinism proves that salvation is not about persuasion. You can't convince people to come to Christ. No, the Savior does all the saving. Now, the five points of Calvinism were not invented by John Calvin. It was simply Calvin who communicated these biblical doctrines more clearly than anyone else before him. They teach that all people are born enslaved to sin, hating God. They teach the biblical truth that all people deserve hell and nobody wants to be saved. They teach that God is not obligated to save any of us, but they also teach that God, in His mercy, before the foundation of the world, elected to save some. Namely, that God will save His people and will leave the rest to justice. But there is no injustice here, just justice and mercy. In the same way that God elected the Israelites and not the Philistines, He elects the people of His church and leaves the rest to His wrath. There is no wrong here. God is God and can exercise justice upon whomever He wills and can save whomever He wills. So is Calvinism biblical? Yes. It's the biblical idea that without God loving me, electing me, predestining me, calling me, justifying me, and preserving me, I would perish. This is why Paul can say, for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. 
And then, uh, of course, the advertisement there for Relearn. John MacArthur recently org. said. Uh, and so he's going back over uh, the video, going back to what John MacArthur once said. Um, and so you heard the video in its entirety. So I cannot be accused of not letting him speak for himself. As some people say, you represent Calvinists. I don't know how to better represent Calvinism than to let Calvinists speak for themselves. And that's what we do every single broadcast here. I read from their institutions. I read from their catechisms. I read from their statements of faith. I play the leading Calvinistic sources out there. I don't know how to better allow them to be represented than to represent themselves. Um, and so as I'm already seeing the comments on the side. So many of you have watched long enough to know exactly where we're going with our uh, rebuttals of, of Dale. And I'm, I'm sure Dale means well, um, but there, there are some blatant errors that I think many of you are already picking up on in his, in his views here. One, um, oftentimes people will quote from scholars or recognizable names like John MacArthur, uh, Charles Spurgeon. Why? Because these are likable people. These are people that are more popular. And sometimes that gives more credence to a particular perspective. We could do the same thing. I'm not saying that uh, that's just Calvinist. Uh, all of us can do that, where we want to quote from Billy Graham or somebody like that um, in order, or A.W. Tozer or C.S. Lewis or someone like that from our side of the aisle um, in order to validate or verify our views. But of course, these are not our authorities. Our authority is scripture. And I'm sure Dell, if he were with me right now talking, he would probably say the same thing, okay? I'm sure he's high on Scripture. He thinks that Scripture is our authority. Um, he is just arguing that, um, obviously, Calvinism represents the best interpretation of the Scripture, and that's what we're pushing back on. That's what we're saying, hey, uh, that's just not what, what the Bible teaches, um, and, and here's why. And then we're going through the verses that they bring up as proof texts and explaining to them how we would interpret them. And they may be persuaded and leave Calvinism, as many of you have uh, in the side chat. Many of you have commented about leaving Calvinism after coming to watch Sociology 101 for a time. And I appreciate those testimonies of how people can be, uh, I, I think, uh, one back to the truth of Sociology 101. And in, in other words, I think it's uh, Sociology 101 is the base level. You've got to understand the provision of God for everybody and the love of God for everybody before you move on to Sociology 201. Uh, you've got to get the basics down first. And um, and the basics, I think, uh, really are foundational with God's love and provision. What's his intention in providing Christ? What's, his, what's the, the purpose of God in salvation? The first statement he makes here is uh, from MacArthur. Let's listen. I became a Calvinist because the Bible gave me no other option. Okay, so did the Bible give him no other option? Because every other Christian who has not become a Calvinist obviously took another option. That So there is other options besides Calvinism when you read the Bible. There's a lot of very strong Bible-believing Christians who did not interpret the Bible Calvinistically. And so if you believe what Calvinists tell you, then the reason John MacArthur interpreted it correctly on Calvinism is because God ordained him to interpret it correctly while he ordained, apparently, the non-Calvinist to misinterpret the Bible, which is simply untenable. It's untenable to believe that God has ordained for some of his children to misinterpret the Bible for his own glory. That's sh so, some, some views don't need to be refuted. They just need to be clearly stated so you see them for what they are. And it's just... Uh, irrational to suggest that God ordains some of his own children to interpret the Bible rightly and some of them wrongly. This is where free will steps in. The reason there are two different interpretations where both people read the same Bible and come to different interpretations is because of free will. You have the ability to misinterpret a text, to, to come to the wrong conclusion because of your presuppositions, because of uh, the, 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 your upbringing, the influence that you had on your life. Um, why do you think it is that Calvinism is male dominated and young person dominated? In other words, when you when you do statistics, run statistics um, for Calvinism, you will see a higher, uh, larger number of males, and you will see a higher, larger number of young people. Um, right now, at least in our society, statistically, what does that mean? Um, you will also see people who are bent certain ways, uh, personality in the personality tests, people who are are detail minded. Uh, uh, very high in math, like you know, Chris Date, I think of, who's a computer programmer, these kinds of people, these, these kinds of people tend towards Calvinism because it's a very deterministic philosophy. They're drawn to that. Well, why, why would they interpret the Bible that way then? Maybe because of presuppositions, influences that they have in their life, personality influences. 
uh, males are more drawn to maybe a stricter, harder, harsher kind of doctrinal uh, th teaching. The reasons that people come to these conclusions, um, if Calvinism is true, is because God's ordained it, determined ultimately by decree for them to believe those things. And the rest, obviously, for whatever reason, God hasn't ordained for us, a uh, poor non-Calvinist, to, to misunderstand these things. And so the, obviously the Bible does give other options. In fact, there are a lot a lot of better options than the Calvinistic conclusions with regard to many of the texts that they use as their proof text. And they're viable biblical options. In fact, even Calvinists who are intellectually honest, many of them we've had on our show who will admit, well, that interpretation, it could mean this or it could mean this. We've played John Piper saying that about several passages where they say, well, viable, this is one viable interpretation, but here's another viable interpretation. Okay, well then there's options, right? And for MacArthur to, to make the statement, which is really what he's trying to, try to, trying to emphasize, is that the Bible is what convinced me that Calvinism is true. And I understand that. Of course, we can say the same thing. The Bible is what convinces us that provisionism is true. So what's the deciding factor? Well, on Calvinism, it's God. God decides whether a Christian will become a provisionist, an Arminian, or a Calvinist, or any other ism. That's simply an untenable way of, of thinking of these things. And so that's one of the reasons we're pushing back. Charles Spurgeon said, Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. Okay, now we've talked about Calvin, uh, this quote that Calvinism is the gospel made popular by Spurgeon. One, I, I will say there's almost as many quotes from Spurgeon speaking out against many of the points of Calvinism that are made popular today by men like Piper. And we've used many of those quotes, in fact, to uh, debunk some of the misinterpretations of Scripture. And I can give examples of that, but we won't take the time to do that. Um, some of the debates during Spurgeon's day, uh, because if I remember correctly, he followed Gill uh, there at uh, the Tabernacle Church where he was preacher, where he's a famous preacher. He followed Gill, who's a very high Calvinist. And some scholars seem to think that when he first came into that pulpit, he was a lot more Calvinistic than he was by the end of his life. Now, I'm no Spurgeon scholar. That's just something that was passed on to me throughout the years. Um, and so sometimes when people refer to Calvinism, sometimes they're referring to simply the doctrine of eternal security versus the doctrine of uh, more of losing your salvation because you sin too much. That might have been a more uh, hot topic debate at the time. And so they referred to Calvinism or the term Calvinism as meaning eternal security, which we all know that's not necessarily a dividing point with regard to what Calvinism entails versus what provisionism entails, at least. And so you got to keep those things in mind. And plus, to say that Calvinism is the gospel, think about the unique claims of TULIP. Which one of those unique claims of TULIP are essential to the gospel? I would love Dale to answer that question. Which which one of the tulip doctrines are essential to the message of Christ crucified? Um, I preach Christ and Him crucified, I, and nothing else. The Apostles' Creed. Why do you need tulip to preach the the key tenets of the gospel? We even had. Um, not long ago, a Calvinist on the program who critiqued other Calvinists for using that kind of vernacular of calling Calvinism the gospel, because ultimately, whether you mean to or not, what you're saying is, if you're not a Calvinist, you really don't believe the gospel. If you don't believe the tenets of Calvinism, the unique tenets of Calvinism, then you really don't believe the gospel. And and that, that's just uh, that's just bad argumentation, bad theology all, all the way around. And many Calvinists even believe that that's bad theology and, and just polemic uh, and doesn't is not really helpful to the church at all. So why do so many people reject Calvinism? Yeah, why do so many people reject Calvinism, Dale? Because God sovereignly and unchangeably ordained it before the foundation of the world according to the claims of your systematics, according to the claims of the most popular Calvinistic um, catechisms and statements of faith, the reason most Christians do everything they do is because God sovereignly and unchangeably ordained what they should do. That's what Calvin taught, at least. That's what the institutions teach. That's what the Westminster can teach us. Um, so to answer your question, is God ordained it that way? God ordained Leighton to be a Calvinist for 10 years and then to start a broadcast called Soteriology 101 that denounces and shows why Calvinism isn't biblical. God ordained that unchangeably 
for his glory, according to the claims of your system. Again, some things don't need to be refuted. They just need to be clearly stated so that you see them for what they are and you know what to do with them. Um, and so that, that's the answer to your question, Dale, is because God ordained it, if you're going to be consistent within your system. Now, if you're not going to be consistent within your system, you'll say something like, this is the reason that so many people reject Calvinism. So many, even Christians, reject Calvinism. Because it requires us to realize that we have no involvement in the cause of our salvation. Okay, you're required to believe that you have no involvement in the cause of your salvation. I guess I'm a Calvinist then because I don't believe I have involvement in the cause of my salvation. Because I don't conflate my choice to repent and believe with God's cause to save me. God can save whomever he wants to. The fact that he chooses to save those who repent and believe is his prerogative. He, I'm not causing him to do anything by repenting and believing. He doesn't have to save repentant believers. I, I, we've gone over this a million times on this program, and so I know a lot of you on the program are going, Leighton, gosh, we get it. It's, I have to keep correcting Calvinists over and over and over again. So I'm going to repeat the same arguments again and again. Sorry. It's just the way it is. Um, what Calvinists do is they conflate the choice of man to repent and believe with the choice of God to save whosoever repents and believe. And, and it's, it's the whole pie illustration that I've talked about before. They make salvation into one big pie, and they say, okay, how much of that percentage, you know, those pie charts, how much percentage are you giving credit to man for salvation, and how much percentage are you giving credit for God? And they'll try to paint the Arminian and the non-Calvinist and the provisionist like we're painting this pie, and we get in this little sliver of 1% credit to man for salvation and the other 99 percent of that pie we're giving credit to god and the calvinist is coming in piously go not us we're giving 100 percent credit to god for salvation he is 100 percent the cause of our salvation and we get zero percent of that pie and we're just going uh there's two separate pies gentlemen there's two separate pies there's the pie of salvation god chooses to save and God can save whomever he wants to save. And he can do it however he wants to do it. So that's not the debate. <laughs> it's the debate is, what has God chosen to do? How has he revealed his plan of redemption and salvation? He is not obligated to save anyone. Just like the father in the prodigal son story is not obligated to restore the son when he returns home. It's two separate pies. The son was 100% responsible for his sin in the far country. And he's also 100% responsible for humbling himself and returning home. That is all the son's responsibility. 100%. That's his own pie because it's his own responsibility. Because guess what? God created him with the ability to respond. And that's why it's 100% his responsibility. Over here, the other pie is 100% God, the father, who chooses in his mercy and grace to restore the son upon his return home. He doesn't have to do that. He is 100% the cause of salvation, period. Only when you conflate man's choice to repent with God's choice to save the repentant and make them into one pie do you get this kind of conflation that you hear from Calvinists like this online. And you got to stop and you got to try to explain it to it. It's like untangling. I remember going fishing with my grandpa. I loved fishing with my grandpa before he passed. And um, that poor man, uh, he would spend so much time untangling fishing wire from us grandchildren who would get it all tangled up. And I, I don't know how... He could be so patient, but he was always so patient to deal with all of the fishing gear. And it wasn't until I became a father myself and began to take my kids out fishing that I realized how much work my grandfather did to make fishing fun for us. Um, but I would remember him just getting like a, it was like a, just a nest of fishing wire. And he, just, he, and he was, he was frugal. He grew up in the world war two times. And so he was not the kind of like I am to just throw this stuff away. You know, he would sit there meticulously and un, untangle this fishing line, uh, this fishing line, and just get it all back, you know, and reel, reel it back up. And he was very good at it. Um, th that's kind of what you've got to do with Calvinists. You've, you've got to sit down with them and go, okay, that is a tangly mess of a bunch of fallacious arguments. And I know they sound really convincing and pious, and there's a lot of cool, you know, one-liners and bumper sticker type statements here, but let's just untangle everything you're saying here. Remove the determinism. Let's just take off the philosophical determinism off of all this and just go back to the basics of what the Bible says. 
uh, about God's love and provision for all people and that he desires the salvation of all men and, and go through the texts that teach these things and then also go through the Calvinistic proof text and just demonstrate to them where they have misaligned the scriptures or what they're not seeing when they read these passages um, as, as if they're supporting Calvinism when, uh, when, when clearly understanding, I think, the proper hermeneutics of the passage and the context of the passage, they never do. All right, moving on. It's the biblical truth that we don't choose Christ, but Christ chooses us. Okay, false dilemma. Um, it's not either or, it's both and, okay? God chooses us. He chooses to save the world by sending his son that whosoever may believe. That is his choice. Um, and then we choose whether to obey and respond. Uh, we choose whether to accept his appeal or not. Um, and and if we choose to believe and trust in him, return home from our pigsty, then it's his choice as to whether he will restore us or not. And the Bible promises that he does if we return home, but he's not obligated on the basis of anything outside himself. In other words, he will fulfill his promise to restore us if we come home, but he was never obligated to make the promise in the first place or to provide atonement in the first place. He chose to do that. And so um, he's not obligated by anything outside himself. In other words, we're not causing him to restore us when we come home by coming home. Okay, uh, He will fulfill his promise by restoring us when we come home because he promised he would do so. So it's on the basis of his goodness and the basis, uh, ba the, the base, ba basis of fulfilling his promise. That's one of the reasons I, I titled my book, The Potter's Promise, because it's about the father fulfilling his promise to restore those who come home. And so he, he will do it because he's, uh, he's faithful to keep his promises. And so it's not choosing Christ or choose, him choosing us. Uh, it, there's, it's a false dilemma. Like either it's this or it's this. No, it, it's both and uh, properly understood. Calvinism proves that salvation is not about persuasion. You can't okay, Calvinism proves salvation is not about persuasion. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Calvin salvation is not about persuasion but leading somebody to faith is about persuasion again if you don't make that conflation you don't have this problem uh, go to acts 28 verse 23 and read where it says paul met with them and tried to persuade them all day long teaching them through the law and the gospels that's not my words that's the inspired text he tried to persuade them. He didn't try to persuade them so as to save them himself, as if he's the one doing the saving. He's trying to persuade them so they'll come to faith so that God will save them. Do you see the conflations? Do you see the fallacies kind of stacked on top of each other here? Um, so this, this concept and idea that we're not, to, it's almost like we're not supposed to really be trying to persuade people. The Bible talks about persuasion three times more often than it talks about predestination. And yet you've got men like this on YouTube and on Instagram and other places trying to downplay persuasion as if it's not a biblical concept. And that's just, that's, I think that's a little dangerous. I think we need to be persuaded. It's what apologetics is all about. It's trying to people, help people to see the value and the good reasons for why we believe what we believe. That's what persuasion is, is really all about. Um, and he goes on to talk about you can't convince people to come to Christ. You can't convince people to come to Christ. No, the Savior does all the saving. Notice, again, he's conflating the saving with the choice of the person to come to Christ for salvation, as if they're one and the same thing. And again, most of his fallacies are based upon that, that one conflation. Now, the five points of Calvinism were not invented by John Calvin. It was simply Calvin who communicated these biblical doctrines more clearly than anyone else before him. They teach that all people are born enslaved to sin, hating God. They teach the biblical truth that all people deserve... Okay, so all people are born in sin and hating God. Okay, um, I know the passages that they typically uh, go to to prove this, but none of the texts teach this concept and idea that all children from infancy just hate God and will always reject him. Um, that's not my, my experience as a father of four. Has it been yours? Um, it's just not true. Uh, the Bible talks about let the, if you don't become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, there's example after example of, of children um, being examples of humility and what God is asking us to become like in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so the, the, this concept and idea that we're born just these, you know, viper and diaper, God hating, you know, you know, 
wrath-filled kind of people is just not a biblical concept in my estimation. Now, are we guilty in need of a, of a Savior because of our own sin? Of course, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But that doesn't mean that, that all are born without the ability to recognize that fact when they're taught these truths and come to faith and follow God. And that's the assumption that sometimes Calvinists make, is that no one is righteous, no, not one, equals no one can confess they're unrighteous so as to trust in Jesus. That's a non sequitur. Of course, no one's righteous, no, not one. That's why we have to trust in the righteous one. And the Calvinists are saying, well, trusting in the righteous one would be a righteous thing. And since no one's righteous, you can't do that. Paul just doesn't make that leap. Uh, Calvinists are kind of inserting that kind of a leap there. Um, he also talks about how they deserve hell. Everybody deserves hell. Well, on what system does everybody deserve hell? Because on the Calvinistic system, everyone is born guilty for sins that somebody else did before they were ever born. And thus the deserving of hell seems a lot less than what it would be on the view that we would hold to because the reason that people deserve hell is because, as Paul says, they perish because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. And so, yeah, we agree, yeah, they deserve hell, but they deserve hell for a lot better reasons on provisionism than they do on Calvinism because on Calvinism, you kind of feel sorry for them as victims of God's decree. They were reprobated before they were born, for goodness sake. They didn't have any control over the nature they were born with, with this hatred they have for God. You make them less blameworthy by saying this kind of stuff. Of course we believe they deserve hell, but they deserve hell much more so on our view than on Calvinism because they're actually rejecting an actual provision of Christ. Jesus actually died for them on our view. He didn't die for them on five-point Calvinism. He didn't really love them on true five-point Calvinism. They're much less blameworthy and much less deserving of hell on Calvinism's claims. And so, yeah, when he keeps talking about how they deserve hell, I go, well, yeah, I don't want to contend with that statement, but I want to contend with you saying that statement because on your view, how can you say they justly deserve hell when your view has them not even able to respond positively to the truth and the light that God brings them by which they'll be held accountable. Again, that's part of the problem of Calvinism. Deserve hell and nobody wants to be saved. Okay, nobody wants to be saved. Well, I mean, you could tell that to, to, to Derek Webb. Um, I, I know we've played this so many times, but I, I can't help it. Uh, let, let's just play it one more time because I, I, wanna, I want you to hear what he says with regard uh, with regard to this. Watch. Let's watch this. With my Christian friends who try to convince me of this, I say, listen, like, I don't know why you're trying to persuade me. Hmm. Because your own Bible says it's a gift. that it's a gift, it's the work of the Spirit start to finish, it's, a, it's the, a removing of a heart of stone or replacing with a heart of flesh. That is not something you can do for me. Yeah. So if it's true, we're both depending on the Spirit to show yeah. up. I'm literally in the grave next to Lazarus yeah. waiting, for to the hear, quickening waiting, waiting to hear my name. Yeah. And now keep in mind, this, this is Derek Webb, former lead singer for Cabin's Call, a staunch Calvinist back in his uh, younger days, who was listed in the top 50 most influential people for the movement of Calvinism by the Gospel Coalition. And yet he's become an atheist now and he's talking Calvinism. And he's saying, you know, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't believe in this stuff anymore. And and I'm, lay, I'm laying there next to, like Lazarus. And if he's gonna call me out, which is exactly what Calvinists teach, that salvation's like Lazarus being made alive, even though the story of Lazarus never draws that link sociologically, that's what Calvinists do. And that, that's the excuse he's giving. He's ultimately saying, I'm dead like Lazarus, and if you know he's going to wake me up, he's going to wake me up. But listen to the next part. And I'm going to lay in there dead till he shows up. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, near the beginning of this year of living Christianly, well, what would it take for you to believe? What would it take for mm. you to believe in God? Well, that's easy. God would have to give me faith yeah. Yeah. because um, I can't yeah. reach out and yeah. grab it. What it would take is a miracle. It would take a miracle. Yeah. It would. Like, and, and what, 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 what does it take for a dead man to come out of his, to come six feet out of the ground. Yeah. It takes someone to dig him out, yep. to open the box and revive him. Breathe into his nostrils. And, and the Bible makes it very clear that there is nothing less spiritually than that going on yeah. in salvation. Absolute new life. New life from death to life. Yeah. yeah. And that's what would be required. Yeah. And and I I, I And I'm open to that. it. I'm I mean I'm oh, literally yeah. I'm literally in the grave waiting to hear my name. Yeah, any time. If, that, if that's the Because if there is gonna be a work of the spirit going on I want in. And I won't be I, able to resist it. Yeah. I, I want I want in. That sounds like people who want to be saved. I want in. I'm waiting for that unilateral 
work of the Holy Spirit that irresistibly is going to cause me to believe in him. I'm just waiting on it. What have they done? They have abrogated their responsibility to put their faith in Christ to God. Why? Because that's what Calvinism taught them to do versus what the Bible says to do. Humble yourself. Repent of your sin. Follow him. And in following him, your faith is strengthened as you see and work with him and see how he answers your prayers. You walk daily with him and growing in your faith and having a childlike simplicity of faith and trusting him. Instead of that kind of a teaching, no, no, no I'm going to unilaterally wait for God to work upon me. And if he's chosen me, maybe he's just, as he goes on to say here, maybe he's just created me for me destruction. Maybe he's just, he's just reprobated me. Listen. I can't call out for it. Yeah. I cannot coax him over. Yeah. Either my name is written in the book of life or it's not. Yeah. But there's a point where I said, you know what, maybe, maybe God made me and fashioned me for destruction. Yeah. yeah. And so there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change his mind about it. So maybe it's all real and I'm just not chosen. That's the lyrics of a new song he wrote. Maybe this is all real and I'm just not chosen. That is devastating to me that people are actually using this theology as their excuse for their unbelief and unrepentant hearts because it gives them the best excuse you can possibly imagine. Maybe I'm just created for destruction. Maybe God's going to glorify me in my, uh, my, my, my judgment. And I just can't do anything about that. That's all on God. It's all God's responsibility anyway. So I'm just going to lay here like Lazarus and wait for him to do it all for me. That's the devastating impact that determinism can have on individual lives. And you've got to deal with that, Calvinist, because it's real and it happens. Listen. They teach that God is not obligated to save any of us, but they also teach that God, in his mercy, before the foundation of the world, elected to save some. Okay, we all agree God's not obligated to save anyone. Like I already said before, he obligates himself by promising that whosoever believes, he will save. Okay, the concept and idea that God elects unilaterally some people before the foundation of the world in order to make them believe is not a biblical concept. We've gone over Ephesians 1, which is usually the proof text used for this kind of thing, but you got to remember verse 1 and 2 tells us who he's talking to. He's talking to the the saints who are in Ephesus. He's talking to the faithful in Christ Jesus, the faithful in him, and the term in him is repeated over and over and over. They are chosen in him. So where are they when they're chosen? They're in Christ. Who's in Christ? Believers are in Christ. And he's chosen for believers, whether Jew or Gentile, male or uh, female, slave or free. He's chosen from before the foundation of the world. He has chosen that they will become holy and blameless. That's sanctification. That's being coming like Jesus. Just like he says in, in Romans chapter 8. God is predestined for us to become like Jesus. Who is he predestined to become like Jesus? Believers. Those who are in Christ through faith. Predestination is about God predetermining what will happen to those who are in Christ. It is not about God picking unilaterally certain individuals, just almost like a lottery, divine lottery before the foundation of the world and saying, I'm going to make that person a believer, I'm going to make that person a believer, and I'm going to make that person a believer, and that person, that person, that person, and the rest of them are all going to be born in a condition where they can't respond positively to me because of the nature they're born with and they have no control over it, and they're going to be damned from eternity before they're ever born without any hope of salvation. That's just not the Bible, people. That is determinism being read into the scriptures. It is not from the Bible. Namely, that God will save his people and will leave the rest to justice. Okay, we all believe God will save his people. Who are his people? Believers. Okay, it's that simple. Who are his people? Believers. People who put their faith and trust in him. And anyone and everyone can believe and trust in him. No one is left without hope of salvation. No one is left without atonement. No one is born unwanted by their maker. That is not a biblical concept. And yes, the left are left to actual justice. Justice for rejecting the truth that was provided for them, suppressing the truth that they could have and should have accepted. Yet on Calvinism, because of what T teaches, they could not have accepted the truth because God didn't really want them. He didn't give them the nature by which they could accept the truth. Again, we don't find that in Scripture. But there is no injustice here, just justice and mercy. Okay, there is no injustice here. Of course, we all agree there's no injustice. Uh, because we believe people are actually responsible, able to respond with free will, with their ability to, to accept or reject the truth that's being presented. So there's no injustice on provisionism, but you have to make a case of how it's not injustice for God to ultimately determine everyone's fate before they're born, and ultimately where they're born in a condition where they can't do otherwise. You, you have to explain the justice of that. You have to give credence for the justice of that. And I, I, I'm not convinced that Calvinists have a good theodicy 
and a good uh, uh, apologetic for the justice of God, given the claims of their system. Mercy. In the same way that God elected the Israelites and not the Philistines, he elects the people of his church and leaves the rest to his wrath. Okay, so again, he conflates election to service with election to salvation. He elected the Israelites to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Those aren't my words. Those are God's words. Read Genesis 12, 3. I have chosen you, Abraham, and your seed to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. If your doctrine of election has God choosing some people to the neglect of all others, then you don't have a biblical doctrine of election. God chooses the nation of Israel, a ragtag small nation that is not worthy of being chosen more than any other nation. They're not impressive. They're not great in number or anything like that. He chooses a small group of people for a service. And what is that service? To bring salvation to the nations of the world. In other words, God has chosen people within that nation, not to the neglect of other people, but for the benefit of other people. So he chooses his apostles, not to the neglect of other people, but to benefit other people. There's a big difference in those two views of election. And his view of election ultimately has God choosing the nation of Israel to the neglect of the Philistines and all the other nations in that area. And that's simply not the truth. Not when you read the stories of men like Jonah, uh, who are called to go to the Ninevites. The Ninevites were just as unruly as the Philistines. They were a, a bad group of people. Um, but yet God desires to see their salvation. He desires to see them come uh, to, uh, to his mercy. And he sends a messenger to them. Okay, And so the reason we point that out is because Jonah, by his free will, didn't want to go. So he takes off to Tarsus. And so what does God do? He steps in and uses normative means, a big storm, uh, and a large fish to convince Jonah to go where he's supposed to go, to Nineveh. But proof that God uses normative means like a big light and fish uh, and a storm and those kinds of things to convince the will of his own messenger to complete the service that he's elected him to do is certainly not proof that God has used some kind of irresistible, ir effectual means um, that's secret and hidden to cause certain people believe their message when they preach it. Like God picked certain Ninevites out that he's going to effectually irresistibly cause to believe Jonah's message? That, that, that doesn't make any rational sense. Yeah, God, God, of course, does elect people to fulfill his promises and his service and, and to do what he promises that they are going to do. And when they're unfaithful, he's faithful. He has ways to persuade his chosen messengers to deliver the message even when they don't want to. And he does step in to make sure that happens, like the, the road to Damascus experience. But how many times have you heard Calvinists use the road to Damascus experience or the calling of Jonah as if it's a proof text for individual salvation? That's what he's doing right here. Look at how God chose the Israelites. Well, that's exactly how he chooses us for salvation, to the neglect of everyone else that's not saved. It's just not a biblical concept. There is no wrong here. God is God and can exercise justice upon whomever he wills and can save whomever he wills. Do we disagree with that? Nope. He can exercise justice on whomever he wills. If God wanted to, he could have created a world and he could have exercised justice by saying, people who are born with blue eyes, I'm going to save and everyone else, gone. I'm just going to damn them. He could have done it that way. Okay. I don't think he would do it that way because I don't think that's his character. And I don't think he does do it that way because that's not what he reveals in the Bible. But this is not about what God could do. God can show mercy to whomever he wants to show mercy. The Bible is just not secretive about this, though. He tells us exactly on whom he shows favor and mercy. Those who are humble and contrite of heart, who confess they can't save themselves. So when you say, I'm not righteous and I need help, God shows mercy to you. He doesn't have to. He's merciful. He chooses to do this. Um, and so, yeah, he can save whomever he wills to save. And who does he will to save? Those who trust in him. So is Calvinism biblical? No. Yes. It's the biblical idea that without God loving me, electing me, predestining me, calling me, justifying me, and preserving me, I would perish. This is why Paul can say, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Okay. We all believe that from him, through him, and to him are all things, including our ability to make rational decisions, including our ability to reason, to think. Come. Let us reason together. God gave us the ability to do that. And so even on our view, all things are from God. You just can't assume that God hasn't given us the capacity to reason, to think, and make decisions for ourselves, as uh, I think the Calvinistic system would ultimately have, because on T, you're born with this moral incapacity to respond positively to God's appeals unless he unilaterally works upon your heart to give you a new nature, causing you to certainly 
uh, respond positively to his appeals. That's just theistic determinism. And it removes any, I think, meaningful sense of human responsibility. Um, and that's why we're standing up against these things so vehemently. Okay, and then there is the rest of that. So let me go ahead and shut that down. Um, and I, I want to turn to the side chat a little bit here and the video or uh, any any of the, the things that I've raised here because I want to make sure that we, we take the time to, uh, to, to engage with questions that you may have. Um, yeah, and Hutzman's mentioned a point here that's, that's, I think, worth calling out. The apostles and prophets had a sp special calling that was different from ours. Um, and I, I, I don't know what a lot of you are having side chat conversations, and so I'm not sure who he's responding to in particular there. But oftentimes I see in these kinds of discussions um, the, the conflation of God's choice of his messengers with the conflation of soteriology. And you'll see this for John 15, 16, for example, uh, where Jesus says to his apostles, I chose you, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Well, read over in Acts, where there's a parallel of that discussion is he's choosing from among his followers, the 12 to be apostles. And so he's talking about them having, cho choosing them for apostleship. Uh, even James White has a clip where he actually can, admits that, that that's actually what John 15, 16 is in the context of God choosing out his apostles from among uh, the greater number of followers. And so uh, you, you got to look at the context of these kinds of discussions in order to understand uh, the, the way they should be understood. And the, the problem that I think a lot of Calvinists or those who lean towards Calvinism have is that, that once you put on the quote unquote lenses of Calvinism, you've kind of taken on their presuppositions, then you have what's called that confirmation bias to where when you start reading through the Bible, you start seeing Calvinism, even where Calvinism doesn't exist, like John 15, 16, that even Calvinists uh, who know better recognize is not really about soteriological choice or election. Um, but it seems like it is and because you have that confirmation lenses on where you just see Calvinism and everything that you read. And then it becomes, it seems like this overwhelming, oh, look, Calvinism's everywhere. Well, the truth of the matter is the opposite also can happen. When I came out of Calvinism and I took off those lenses, I began to see provisionism everywhere. Um, so it happens both ways. Um, it, it's, it's not, I know it feels like it's overwhelming to whatever system you're holding to, but um, th that's why we always point out the duck and the rabbit illustration. It may seem like a duck to you until you see the rabbit. And then once you see the rabbit, you're always going to see the rabbit. And it's really hard to kind of shift your gears uh, through that. Um, I'm just uh, trying to take some time. I've d not done this in a while, so I want to take some time to make sure um, to, to engage with some of the side chat. Uh, the Catechism is asking, Leighton, can you do a video comparing the original pre-Reformation doctrine of original sin to the Reformed doctrine of original sin? They did not teach people are born guilty. It may be good. Um, I, I plan on having Dr. Adam Harwood back on the program eventually. Uh, he's going to talk about his systematic, but we're also going to talk a little bit about um, his his work on uh, original sin and the doctrine of original guilt, because I, I still think his work is some of the best work that's out there that's, as far as I know, has not been refuted with re regard to uh, original guilt and the concept of inherited uh, guilt from Adam uh, as if we're held accountable or responsible um, or we're held guilty because of what our parents did, which is uh, directly refuted through many texts uh, throughout scripture. And, um, and, and I think it's based upon a misreading of, of Romans chapter 5, as we've talked about in other episodes. But we may do more on that in the future. Um, okay, just sneaking through, slipping through some of these just to see if I can catch any other videos um, or any other questions about video, the video. Um, All right. Well, thank you for the, Gordon, thank you for um, your, your kind words from South Africa. Blessings to you as well. Thank you for that. All right. Sometimes I need a uh, producer to read uh, through the comments and pick out some of the questions for me because it takes a little while to, to do that. Um, Here is uh, here. Oh, 
it's showing my internet is low for some reason. I don't know how that's possible, uh, but nevertheless. Um, I, I'm getting this question more and more. Um, I get it. I get it quite often, and I've answered it before. Um, but let me entertain it again. Um, if someone believes in a false Jesus that only died for a few and not the world, how are they saved? In other words, the it's it's worded in many different ways. This kind of a question is: How can a Calvinist believe believe in Calvinism and still be a Christian? Uh, or still be saved in in that regard. Well, I believed Calvinism for 10 years of my life, and I don't believe I lost my salvation. I didn't feel the Spirit exit my body and not be able to feel His presence in my life or anything. I don't don't think I lost my salvation when I became a Calvinist at the age of 19 uh, and stopped being a Calvinist about 10 years later. I I don't think, uh, yeah, I just, I, I think people can have misinterpretations. Now, are there some Calvinists who aren't born again? Even John Piper says, yeah, there's people can hold the doctrinal system uh, without necessarily being born again. And that's true on both sides of the theological aisle. But that's not for me to know. I have no idea each individual person's own faith journey and their beliefs. They may, they may genuinely trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation, but yet have some f- erroneous beliefs with regard to a very deep philosophical co- concept of predestination because of what they were taught or because of their own presuppositions or some of the other reasons that we've mentioned. I, I don't know how anyone can speak with any kind of dogmatism to say that because someone's a Calvinist, they must be going to hell. They must be a, a, an unbeliever. They must not be a real Christian. I, I can't relate to you on that. I, I I see it all the time on comments. A lot of them, I delete them when I see, I just... I'm like, well, I don't get this, people. I know a lot of Calvinistic brothers, some of my best friends, my my nephew, and, and uh, my, some other family members and others are who I know who are strong Calvinist believers. I, and they show fruits of the Spirit, and they love people, and they serve, and they give their life passionately uh, to missions and evangelism and loving God. And I'm just like, I don't know what Calvinist you know. Maybe you just know some distant internet Calvinists that are mean and gross and nasty to you and you've painted them all with pitchforks and horns and I I don't know I that's just not been my experience um yeah I, I know some of them out there because some of them I usually I just have to ignore them and delete them and go well that's not the fruit of the spirit how will you know them by their love so if a Calvinist is showing love to other people um I see a thing of Vody Bacham up here uh, on the thing about Vody. Vody is a strong Calvinist. He's also a friend. I mean, Matt Chandler, I went to school with Matt Chandler. He's a Calvinist, but he's a friend. I'm mean, a godly, godly preacher here in the Dallas area. I, I, I'm just not going there with you. And I, I don't think it's our jobs to, to deem whether someone's saved or lost because they have faulty theology. Is Calvinism a Christian theology? Of course not. Not if it's wrong. <laughs> That's what the whole debate is. But they wouldn't think provisionism, the unique claims of provisionism, are Christian either. To call something Christian is to say it's biblical. And so you're saying, yeah, they believe a non-Christian thing, something that it does not align with Christian teaching. It's wrong. But they can still believe in Christ or trust in Christ for their salvation. That's the same way Catholics. Many Catholics, I believe, are Christians because they trust in Christ for their salvation, though they hold to some errant doctrines that I would disagree with vehemently and stand up against. Um, but people aren't saved by doctrinal fidelity. They're saved by grace through faith. They trust in Jesus for their salvation. So I, 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 I'm just not one of those kinds of people that is going to be casting people out of the kingdom. And if you think you're going to get that from me, uh, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You probably need to go listen to somebody else because that's just not the way I, I handle this ministry or the way I confront my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. And, I, and, I'm, and if I, whoever asked that question, I wasn't coming down on you personally. I know you're just asking. Um, so don't, don't take that as a rebuke towards you, the one asking the question, by any means. Um, I understand the question. But, uh, but I just want to be really clear because there are some others making comments like that that are much more vehement. And some of the harshest critiques I get are from non-Calvinists who think I'm too nice to Calvinists and who write me emails and I've had voicemail messages on my phone because I work with Texas Baptist in ministry and people can get a hold of me and find me through the ministry. And I've had some very harsh 
critiques from non-Calvinists uh, from for treating Calvinists like brothers and sisters. Uh, so some of, some some of the rebukes have been from Calvinists, but the harshest rebukes have been from those who who believe like I do, who who think I should be a lot more harsh with Calvinists and. I just have to kindly tell them, and I'm sorry, you're not going to get that from me, this side of heaven. So, uh, you know, find it from somebody else. But um, I even had one, one was a listener who, who was giving support um, financially. And they were, saying, they were saying, well, I think I'm, I'm going to withdraw my support for the ministry. And they were giving a pretty substantial amount per month. Um, and I think I'm going to withdraw some of my support substantially unless you can really you know, emphasize the fact that this is a doctrine of the devils and these are heathens. These are, these are just stuff like that. I said, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I thank you for your support, but yeah, you can, you can take that somewhere else because I'm just not going to compromise the values and the beliefs that I have with regard to these things. Uh, and, and I was very, I was very cordial with the person, but very, very firm that that's just not the, the way this ministry is ever going to go. If you're waiting for that or looking for that, then then look elsewhere. That's just not where where I'm going to be. Um, I'm just uh, scrolling through here. If Calvinism is tempting so many people to indulge in sin and give up on their faith, why have it why has it survived so long? Um, you know, there's there are some you know obviously you know passages like Romans nine and Ephesians one, if read from that vantage point, can sound like it's supporting Calvinism, and so it it has been a confusing uh, doctrine. Um, you know, there there's a lot of different speculation as to why people believe false teachings. You know, uh, why why would people believe that you would get seventy two virgins if you fly a plane into a building? For goodness sake, that's just ridiculous. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to compare Calvinism to that necessarily. I'm just saying people believe a lot of really strange things um, and are convinced to do so. And, and explaining why certain people believe what they do would be next to impossible. But um, one, one of the, the reasons I think that Calvinism continues or resurged, at least in my generation, is because it, was, it seemed to me to be kind of the other side of the pendulum swing away from the more you know, health, wealth, prosperity, seeker sensitive kinds of, of teachers that were so popular in the nineties, it was like the, the alternative was being offered by the Calvinists, um, the more deep exegetical preachers. And sometimes the pendulum swings from one extreme to the, to the other. And, um, in doing so sometimes that, that can seem like it's a, it's a more weighty or meaty doctrine because determinism seems kind of, uh, intellectualistic and those kinds of things to certain people and they're, they're really drawn to that kind of way of, of looking at how the world works. Uh, and, and sometimes people like a little tidy system that because Calvinism is kind of a tidy little system that answers all the questions. And how does it answer all the questions? God. You know, God does, God, why, why does sin happen? God determined it. God de decreed it. And I'm, of course, uh, reductionistic a little bit because not all Calvinists agree on every point of how philosophically that works. But Nevertheless, um, generally speaking, the Calvinists are theistic determinists, and and that gives that answer to all the questions. God decreed it for His glory. Why does rape? Why does murder? Why does these things happen? God decreed it for His glory, and we will understand better on the other side of heaven. It's kind of the the catch-all question answer for for the for people, and some people like to be able to have answers to every question, um, and it it seems to give some of those answers. I think it creates other quandaries and mysteries and uh, issues that the Bible doesn't afford, but that's, that's up for debate. Um, let's see. Again, I'm just scrolling through. Yeah. Again, a follow up for the question that I answered about whether or not Calvinists are Christians, um, or, you know, believers and they're how far off, of the actual nature of God do you have to be to believing in a different God? Um, you know, that's a good question. But I, I think when someone is believing in Christ as the son of the living God, uh, you can have different philosophical ways in which you would, you know, explain how God works, whether it's Molinism, whether it's determinism, 
uh, whether it's uh, dynamic perspective, open theism, uh, whether eternal now perspective, all these kinds of things, much of those discussions are more philosophical, trying to explain the inscrutable ways in which the omnipresent, all-knowing, powerful God works within time and space with finite creatures. And so I think we should need to show a little bit of mercy, <laughs> a little bit of grace as to how people uh, you know, come to their conclusions with regard to some of those issues. Now, does that mean it's not important? Obviously, I wouldn't be doing a broadcast if I didn't think it was important. It is still important. It is uh, vital to understanding, I think, how God works and what our sanctification, how it looks. It's, it, I think it's very important for evangelism and apologetics for reasons that we just saw with the Derek Webb video. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's very valuable and very important for the reasons I've stated. But um, at the same time, I, I, I'm not coming to the conclusion that therefore anyone who affirms the claims, unique claims of the Calvinistic system must not really be born again believers. I just don't uh, don't believe that to be the case. Um, uh, Israel is asking, can, as, as a Calvinist, can you go up to a random person and start preaching the gospel to them? and truly tell them from the heart that Jesus loves them. Well, John MacArthur is a Calvinist, and he wrote the book, The Love of God, and he argues that you can. Um, I have articles and videos. If you typed in The Love of God, something like that, at, at Sociology 101, you could find it, um, where I explain that, that almost like David Hunt's book answers, asks that question, what love is this? And that, that's pretty much what he's confronting. He's confronting the, the more moderate, moderate or lower forms of Calvinists that try to promote, on one hand, God's love for everybody, while on the other hand, still holding to TULIP. Um, how, how can you say God loves everyone while also believing TULIP, uh, that ultimately uh, certain people are elected for salvation and others for damnation before they're ever born? How can you call that love? And then they, they kind of separate it into two different kinds of love, the general love, rain and sunshine, um, versus uh, the specific or special love for the elect. And again, what kind of love is that? Um, is it the kind of love that seeks its own? Because according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, uh, I mean, 1 Corinthians 10, that's not, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, that's not love. Love does not seek its own. It's patient and kind. That doesn't describe the kind of love that the Bible describes. And, and so I, that's one of the reasons I push back on that. There's much more detail um, there in the videos on that that point. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm trying to scroll through here. I'm so far behind. Y'all have so many questions. Maggie, thank you for your kind words. Um, she's just mentioning that uh, navigating through so much at her church. Uh, and Maggie, thank you for, for those kind of words. I appreciate that. Um, again, sorry for the silence here. I'm just trying to read through to make sure. Uh, what books would you recommend start immersing into the apologetics against Calvinism? Oh, hey, glad you asked. <laughs> Promotion, promotion of the book, uh, Calvinism, a Biblical and Theological Critique, uh, editors by Alan and Lemke. I, I uh, wrote one of the chapters in this book. Just came out uh, there on Lifeway, or you can find it on Amazon. If you get this book, by the way, especially on Amazon, leave a good review because Calvinists are notorious about telling people how they think, <laughs> what they feel online. And so it happened with my book. Uh, when I my, my book first came out, well, both of them, uh, both of my books at one point or another went through this. Uh, both of these, when they came out, uh, Calvinists are the first to start putting reviews and they're usually one star. This guy's a hack kind of reviews. Um, and so I, I remember my book going through that where I had like one, well, I had like a half a star for the first three weeks and I'm like going, good night. And it's just people ranting about how heretical and Pelagian I am and all those kinds of things. Um, and it wasn't until the loving people that watched this program started actually leaving reviews. And now it's a good five stars on both of those books, almost full five stars and, and hundreds of reviews. And so thank you people for doing that. That really does help because uh, believe it or not, people do look at reviews and that really does matter. Uh, same with this new book that just came out. I noticed the first few reviews weren't that, uh, weren't that nice. And, uh, and so it helps when you leave reviews and actually let people uh, know 
from a non-Calvinistic perspective, uh, those things. And so, if, if funny thing is, you know, people, uh, somebody was making a, a comment uh, on our last video and saying, you know, on our Calvinism books, all you people, only, all you, if you read something outside your echo chamber, you would see that us Calvinists really are biblical. This, right, right, right underneath that book is John Piper's book called Providence, which is a defense of, of Calvinism from his perspective, basically. And, uh, and I've got hundreds of other books from Calvinist sources. As a matter of fact, I, I know I have more Calvinist books than I do non-Calvinist books in my library. Um, not only because of what I do, but because I was a Calvinist for 10 years all through my studies. And so I collected a lot of books over the years. Um, so I, I'm, re I'm willing to read outside of my echo chamber, are you? Because not, not, not as many Calvinists as you might think are really willing to, uh, uh, to, to read outside of their own echo chambers. Most of them get caught up in the Calvinistic bubble and they only feed themselves with podcasts from Calvinists and sermons from Calvinists and books from Calvinists. They never really hear or see uh, the the objections in a in an objective way. All right. Um, yeah, there's yeah some more comments about Chris about Calvinists not being saved. I'm just not going to entertain them right now, brothers. I'm sorry. Um, all right. Yeah, a lot of the discussions on the side chat, um, back and forth. And so I'm not seeing, at least right off the top here, uh, a lot of questions. Um, someone's asking about books being translated into Spanish. Uh, God's Provision for All has been translated into Spanish. Um, last I heard, Caleb is still working on the cover being uh, finished, and it will be released soon. I'm not sure exactly when, but yes, uh, Miguel is asking that question. I didn't put you up there. Uh, yes, this book will be released in Spanish very soon, and I get requests literally at least one or two a week asking for my books in, in Spanish. And so I'm glad there's a Spanish audience out there that, that needs it and wants it. Um, and we're doing, we're doing what we can to get that uh, out and released. All right. Yeah, others talking about reading outside of their own beliefs, how important that is to be challenged and to grow, absolutely. Nathan's pointing out to somebody else something that I have to say all the time. We don't believe we make ourselves born again, <laughs> just like we don't believe we save ourselves. Uh, you know, we'd, we're trusting in the Savior. That's not saving yourself, okay? Uh, yeah, I went to the doctor, and the doctor gave me an antidote, the antidote for the illness, so I saved myself. No, the, the doctors with the antidote saved me, Okay. Uh, the fact that I went to the doctor to get help from the doctor doesn't mean I saved myself. It, it seems pretty obvious to these things, but sometimes you you feel like you have to actually uh, actually say them. Yeah, no problem, Miguel. That is awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to it coming out. Um, the Western West, uh, Samuel's talking about the Western eyes. Yeah, we I had Doctor Pritchett on. We talked about that very thing. Um, uh, quotes in my books about that as well, the kind of the individualized, westernized way of seeing the use of Scripture because when we see the word you, Westerners tend to think the individual, me. Uh, you know, And it says, so I, I praise God that he chose you. In th First Thessalonians, I believe it is. Um, well, Paul's talking to a predominantly Gentile crowd, and he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And he's saying, I thank God that he's chosen you, and that the Holy Spirit came to you with power and these things. I think, well, in other words, in the same way for the Jews, when they believe, the Holy Spirit came upon them with power, demonstrating, you know, speaking through tongues and demonstrating that they were true believers, that the same thing happened to you, the Gentile people. And we praise God that he's chosen you from before the foundation, that from the very beginning, this was God's plan. As he says in Ephesians 3, this is what God's plan was, a secret mystery being hidden, that, that the Gentiles were also included within this covenant of grace and um, through faith. Uh, and yeah, so when he says you, uh, the Western I, Westerner hears, oh, me, God, oh, God chose me personally, um, versus what Paul is actually saying in the context of thanking the, you know, 
thank the Lord that God has chosen, he has chosen uh, the Gentiles unto salvation. Things like that are the kinds of things where Westerners will oftentimes read these texts with individualized lenses and, and thus with those confirmation bias lenses on that I talked about earlier, read them wrongly and come to the wrong conclusions. Um, it's no accident that in Eastern Orthodox, uh, you don't have this debate. <laughs> you don't even have this debate. Um, it, it doesn't even exist in Eastern Orthodox, largely because uh, Augustine is not very influential with Eastern teachings and Eastern religions. Um, but Easterners don't tend to have that same hermeneutical problem of reading things through a westernized lens. Uh, and so there's a lot of books on that topic, by the way, that go into more detail about that. But I think it's a, a good point to, to mention. Um, Let's see, JMS is saying, the metaphors for finding the truth in Scripture, seek and you shall find, knock and the door be open, seems to suggest we are proactive agents. How could we read those verses? Well, of course, those are talking to Christians. Um, when it's talking about seeking truth, you know, obviously you're going to disciple uh, Christians and say, seek truth. Uh, um, you know, the Lord stands at the door and knock. He's speaking to the church when he says that. So you're opening the door for Christ to come and dine with you as a believer. Uh, and so, yeah, as Christians, it's calling us to be proactive. Um, and it, that's not necessarily even to say that lost people can't, you know, be proactive in some degree as well. But I think the texts that you're, you're mentioning there are instructions to Christians. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're, we're responders. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I talk about quite often when we're accused of being Pelagian and all this other stuff is if we're the ones that think that we're the ones that save ourselves or we're the ones that initiate salvation or all that nonsense. No, we're God's created us as responders. We're, res, we're responsible people and we're able to respond. He's the initiator. He brings the light. He brings the truth. He brings revelation. He brings conviction. He, he's the one who initiates. Uh, but we're responsible for what we do with the light and the truth and the gospel that he brings. And so um, in, in that sense, we're, we're not the uh, proactive ones with regard to we're not acting first. God's already acted. By the way, he's created us by sending the light, sending the truth, sending the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to the world. All of those things uh, are a part of what God's doing. Uh, Ephesians 5.11, which I assume is a Calvinist uh, based upon maybe some of his comments, that's what happens when you have a channel strictly dedicated to anti-Calvinism. You would think Calvinism is the biggest threat to the church that they aren't Christian. Not surprised. And so I, th I think what he's trying to say is that you shouldn't be surprised there are people who don't think Calvinists are Christians when you start a program. Yet, I'm one of the big, biggest defenders against people saying that Calvinists aren't necessarily Christians. Ironic of all things, right? And so you should be thanking me for correcting that misnomer, not piling on, brother. Um, secondly, when you create a channel for a particular perspective, you're doing that for a purpose and a reason. Why might I create this channel separately from my other evangelistic ministries that I do with um, Texas Baptist? Because this is a controversial in-house discussion. This is a dispute among Christians, right? And it's also a very polemic, oftentimes turns very polemic and can become very contentious. I want that to be behind these doors with Christians on a different page than I would want to have my evangelistic ministry, right? So my motivation for creating the other page isn't what Calvinists assume it is, is Leighton, the raging anti-Calvinist, wants to use his entire ministry and everything he ever does all day long, every day, to attack us. No, no I spend five or 10 hours a week at most on sociological stuff, sometimes much less, depending on my schedule. Most of my time is spent on training people and doing evangelism and reaching the lost and discipling people and, and growing churches and the church health ministry that I work with at Texas Baptist. The fact that you only know me because this site happens to be pretty popular because of the subject content um, is just a part of it. And so we, we talk about that quite, a, quite regularly. But the reason this has been separated out is just the opposite reason for your accusation. Um, just so you're aware. So, now, I can, I can see how somebody from the outside might see me online and see these videos pop up and, oh, this guy, this is, 
he's obsessed and it's all he ever talks about and it's all he ever does. I, I can see how somebody might think that, but once you know better, you know, then you can stop spreading those lies. I mean, it's pretty that pretty simple. All right. Uh, just trying to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions that are actually pertaining to what we're talking about. Some of the discussion is not pertaining to what we're talking about. All right, I'm going to have to scroll down here. Okay, so, okay, here, here's his response. But right, right, but that's the fruit of the channel. Okay, is it the fruit of the channel? Or are people who aren't are against Calvinism would also come to the channel? And wouldn't the fruit of the channel being somebody like myself correcting people who are producing that fruit by saying, I don't think you should do that, right? Uh, you say, I have people tell me all the time Calvinist God is evil. If Calvinism is true, they will answer to God for what they say. Well, if Calvinism is true, they're only saying that because God decreed for them to say it. If Calvin's kind of Calvinism is true, if theistic determinism is actually true, then the reason they're saying that, they'll have to answer to God for God doing what he decreed for them to do. Which, again, that's that's why we think that your systematic isn't tenable. That, that the reason they're, they're, they're refusing to believe in the quote-unquote Calvinistic version of God is because Gal, because God determined them to do that by sovereign decree uh, under the claims of your system. And so uh, that, that's why uh, when we have these kinds of discussions with Calvinists, we kind of just, ah, you know, I, I, have you thought through this? Have you really thought through how you're, how you're rebuking us for things that you believe God's decreed for us to do in eternity past um, based upon your, your own philosophical systematics? Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's Nathan already got to it yeah, before I did. Who are, who are you, old man, to talk back to God? Who decreed us uh, to, to believe this way? And again, uh, that, that's a big part of it. All right. Um, oh, Bob. <laughs> Predestination is on every single page of the Bible. One would have to be blind not to see it. Uh, yeah, well, depends on what you mean by predestination, I guess. Stop defending yourself. Yeah, you're probably right. Um, rhetorical question. Don't Calvinists realize the ideal? <laughs> Going backwards. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow that one. All right. Um, free, what, free grace theology? Uh, well... <laughs> People have asked about free grace theology on a lot of different levels. I, I know David Allen, who's been on the program, wrote a forward for one of the free grace uh, theology books. Um, and so there are some interchangeable, I, I think, aspects of that. Um, but again, asking what are your thoughts on the free grace theology is almost kind of like asking what are your thoughts on Molinism or what are your thoughts on uh you know, Calvinism in general, or what are your thoughts on this? In other words, it's not a monolithic group. There are many people within the free grace movement that hold to various perspectives. Many of them would align almost exactly with provisionists. Uh, a lot of guys that are more of the free grace camp are perfectly fine in our camp of provisionism. Others might not be, and there's there's different nuances based upon the individual scholar you may be talking to. Uh, so it would, it would probably... Uh, be it needed probably need to be a broadcast to go through ex specific examples of free grace theology that that would align with what I would necessarily hold to as a, as my particular brand of provisionism even because even among provisionists there are various perspectives that are maybe nuanced a little differently so that can get a little difficult to to get into. Um, can a person believe? Can a person believe they trust Christ with their salvation while maintaining that faith implies obedience? And without obedience, you are without faith, still consistently claim they deny work salvation. I think I understand the question. I may have to read it a few more times to really grasp what you're saying. But I, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, if somebody genuinely has faith in Christ, they genuinely trust in Jesus. I mean, they, they believe Jesus is the Son of God. They've repented of their sins. 
but they also hold to the false belief that they have to earn God's favor. And they're, so they're working to earn favor with God. Um, and, and somebody said, would, would they really be saved? And I'm like, okay, they may hold to a false doctrine, a false belief that they have to earn favor with God, but still be trusting in Jesus in the sense that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they've repented their sins. They've put their faith in him. But they still may have this false understanding or false belief of the way things work. And a lot of people have testimonies of that where they spent much of their younger, more immature part of their faith trying to earn God's favor and work for their salvation, only later to recognize that that's not the way it works. I've given this testimony before about, you know, the, even in my book, um, I, I write this story about how many, many times our relationship starts out of obligation and fear. Much like with my dad, when he told me to mow the lawn, I said, yes, sir. Why? Because I feared his belt or I wanted the reward. I wanted the allowance. So out of fear of punishment or a desire for reward, I obeyed my dad. Well, fear is the beginning of wisdom, according to scripture. Um, and there is a sense in which we have a fear of reverence towards God. And we do what we do, maybe in our immature uh, starting of the relationship, because we fear his, his wrath and we want the blessings. And so a lot of people begin their relationship with God very immaturely by fearing his wrath and seeking for blessings. But this is what Jesus talks about when he says, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. Uh, no longer do you have a spirit of timidity and fear, but a, a, a spirit of sonship by which you cry out, Abba, Father. The transition there is one of maturity where you, you follow and believe and do what God's called you to do because of a love relationship and intimacy with the Father and uh, walking with him. Just like with my dad today, I, if my dad needs help with something now, I don't fear his belt, thank God. <laughs> Uh, and I don't look for any kind of reward from him. He's not paying me an allowance or anything. And I'll still, Dad, let me help you. Why? I love my dad. The relationship has matured from something that was very immature to something that's mature. But that doesn't mean there's not value in that that beginning step and understanding the fear of the Lord and understanding you know punishment and blessings and those kinds of things. That's the beginning of that relationship. It's just not the end of it. And so there's people at different stages in their walk in a relationship where somebody may genuinely trust in Jesus, but they they still have a false concept of works and, and trying to earn things and trying to you know, earn favor with God and wanting blessings and these kinds of things that, that are driving them uh, to do the things they want to. And it's only later in their life they begin to recognize God's love is, uh, is so much bigger than that and the, the relationship matures. Um, and so, again... This is where I'm not one of the types of people that throw somebody out of the kingdom based upon where they are in their sanctification process. I can't see their heart. I can't see, I can only see the fruit. I can't see the root. Um, and I don't know where God has them in that, that process of salvation and understanding what it means to be saved. And, and, and so I'm not going around, oh, if that person believes this and has this wrong understanding of God, you know, and the way he works, ah, oh, he must not be able, he must be, he must be lost, he must be condemned. I just, I don't think that that's healthy. I don't think it's a healthy way to look at relationships and the way God works. Um, and, and I think we need to be as patient with others as God has been with us. Uh, judge, not lest you be judged, and uh, hold, hold people to standards that you're going to be held to. Um, it seems like the kind of the, the message of scripture that when you hold people to that small debt, when he's forgiven you a great debt, uh, there's a lot of judgment being brought there in those kinds of texts to say, treat people at least with, with as much grace as the grace been shown to you by the father. And I, and I think that means, uh, being willing to, uh, uh, to, to really, uh, love people and, uh, understand that people need time to, to, uh, there's some spam stuff coming up here. I'm having to delete it here. Um, <laughs> well, I, there's some other the other questions coming up, but I, I really need to bring this to an end because I can feel my throat starting to scratch. And so I am going to uh, to, to bring this to a, uh, to a close and remind us, as we always do, when you leave this place, share Christ and show love.